right, so today we're going to talk about patent basics and do a little demystifying of the patent system, which honestly can be quite mysterious if you're not familiar with it. Um, we have to give our disclaimer here. This is not legal advice. Um, we share information, uh, like to give information to the public. Uh, we often will recommend that someone planning to file an application um, look for a registered patent attorney or patent agent. Um, but we like to provide this information both so that you know what to expect if you do consult someone, and it is possible to file your, your own patent application. Um, and so we, we love to provide this information to anyone so that you know what your options are and you can make good decisions moving forward. But, uh, but it is not, we are not your lawyer, it is not legal advice. So here's a little overview. We'll, we'll talk about the history and different types of patents. We'll take a look at a patent application and the information that's on it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about prosecution, which is the term that we use for when you file an application with the office. And there's sort of a back and forth uh, written conversation that goes on about the application. Um, and lastly, we'll talk about some resources um, like pro bono legal resources and the Patent and Trademark Resource Center, um, which Janelle uh, can tell you a lot more about too. Um, and so let's get started. So uh, the foundation for patent, trademark, and copyrights all comes from the Constitution. So there's sort of a little blurb from Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution, and the uh, promotion of Pro the promotion of the progress of science and the useful arts and securing for a limited time um, rights to authors for their writings and discoveries. Um, and so that's the foundation of our patent system. Um, and a patent is a little different from a lot of other rights that we may consider, you know, the constitution provides us as Americans. It really doesn't give you a right to do um, what's described in your granted patent, what it gives you is the right to exclude others from doing what's described in your issued patent. And you, you may wonder, you know, why? why? Why do I only want the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing? Um, and that's because sometimes uh, patents may be granted that have some... Um, overlapping subject matter. Um, there may be a, uh, an application that describes an improvement on an existing invention. So that, that patent may be granted, but it won't necessarily give you a right to do everything that's described unless you have maybe a licensing agreement with that underlying invention that you discovered a great improvement for. Um, so it's a little more complicated that way. It is for a limited term. So for utility patents, which we'll talk a little bit more about, that limited term is 20 years from the date that you file the application. Um, there are a couple of different types of patents. There are utility patents, design patents, and plant patents. And they all have slightly different terms. And we'll get into that a little bit more um, in the next couple slides. Uh, the other thing to note is there is no worldwide patent system. There are a lot of um, agreements and cooperation that different countries um, engage in to sort of assist each other. But when you receive a patent grant, it only covers the United States. So the protection that you receive for that limited term, that 20 years in the case of a utility application, that is just for the United States. So if you have the sort of invention where maybe you'll have some overseas manufacturing and that sort of thing, you would want to look also into getting patent protection in those other countries, which is a, a somewhat separate application process. Um, there are some ways that that's streamlined um, in a process we call the uh, based on the patent cooperation treaty. So people will call those PCT patents. You may hear that term. So here's a, another explanation of the different types of patents. Um, on the left here, it's a utility patent. Uh, let's see, I think it says vandal resistant torque sensitive release mechanism. Um, so you'll see titles like that that are fairly detailed and sometimes fairly complicated, but a utility patent will cover 
um, a device and how it's structured or how it operates, and also methods. So maybe it's methods for using that device or methods for using um, something else. Um, and, and also utility patents are where we'll find uh, chemical compositions like pharmaceuticals, uh, medications, and, and different drugs will also be filed as utility patents. Uh, design patents, that's actually a real design patent there for the Statue of Liberty. Um, she was covered by a design patent. Um, and those are for the ornamental look of a thing. Um, so not how it functions, not how you use it, not even necessarily um, particulars of the structure um, within that, that object, but how it looks on the outside. So um, something like a statue, you know, is a perfect example, but even things like shoes. Um, there are a couple of designers that, that patent a lot of their shoe designs. Um, clothing, uh, glasses, things like that can be um, protected with design patents. And then over on the right, we have a plant patent, and that's for any asexually reproduced plants. Um, and my favorite is the uh, the Haas avocado has a has a plant patent, um, and I I love guacamole and I put it on everything. So <laughs> always uh, that's my go to reference for plant patents. And uh, an invention can have more than one type of patent covering it, and they would be um, separate applications. So you could have something that has a utility patent covering it, and as well as a design patent. Um, maybe you have a a certain type of stereo that has, uh, you know, some special functions that are deserving of a patent grant, and then also the look of that stereo um, is something that's, you know, very popular, and so you want that to be protected, so you can protect it with both a utility and a design patent. So the picture you see here is actually our headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, that's our main uh, building on campus there. Um, so the, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, we are the federal agency that's um, tasked with, you know, both fostering innovation through the patent system and more importantly, creating a reliable, predictable and high quality intellectual property system, because it's very important that applicants know if I do receive this patent, I will be able to use it to prevent people from profiting from my idea that you know, I have this protection for. Um, so why why inventions matter? Um, you know, number one, honestly, for most inventors, is they they want to produce what they've invented. They want to sell a product or you know teach a method, um, and they want to be compensated for that. It may have taken years to come to uh, that innovation, and so. Um, safeguarding that technology for, for that limited amount of time will help the company grow, um, maybe, you know, help return some of that investment money and then also make some profits. Um, but also it'll benefit the community by the new goods and services. Um, and then obviously, you know, personal growth and development and advancement. It is really, you know, I'm always impressed when I meet inventors when I'm on campus, well, in pre-COVID. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it's, it can be a long road to actually commercialize an invention. Um, so this patent system helps people to um, make that, you know, that whole process worth it by uh, regaining, so, oops, I think I've gone backwards here, by, um, you know, being, being able to make a profit. And here's just some statistics to show you, um, you know, IP intensive industries can uh, give employees a lot higher salaries. Uh, they tend to be bigger businesses. There's better benefits. Um, and for college graduates who, you know, may have student loans to pay back and that sort of thing, uh, you know, that's definitely beneficial. And just some more statistics, 44% uh, of all U.S. jobs are in IP. So it's growing even now, um, even though, you know, 44% is a significant uh, number of jobs. You can see 60% uh, higher salaries um, and, you know, contributions to the GDP. I won't read all these numbers, but um, obviously these are statistics showing the benefits of having a robust IP system um, and allowing businesses to take advantage of that limited term. 
And there's some um, websites here if you do want to see more of these statistics and get some more information about those reports, there's links there that you can follow. So now we're going to take a look at what we what information we'll find in a patent application. So this is actually a granted patent. And so you can see here um, some of these things that are labeled like the issue date, uh, the title, um, the inventors are always listed on the front page. So this would be the front page of the patent. Inventors are always listed there. The filing date, which is really important, that's what determines you know, who was first in, in filing for that application. You'll see a listing of prior art. So when we say art, we mean it in the sense of um, you know, a field of art, not uh, you know, the sort of artistic paintings and that sort of thing, right? So prior art can be any published or reproducible um, item that shows uh, something relevant about that invention or is you know, kind of related to that invention. So a lot of times that's other patents that may have been filed before that application. Um, but it can be books, it can be magazines, um, it could even be screenshots of a video, anything that shows uh, relevant content that's similar to that invention or in a related field of that invention is what we consider prior art. Um, there's usually also some drawings on the front of the patent. Drawings aren't necessarily required, um, but I would say 90% of the applications um, that I've seen have them. Sometimes in the chemical arts, they won't necessarily have drawings because drawings may not be very helpful. And there instead, they um, they submit uh, sequence listings, I think it's called, you know, they're more relevant to the chemical arts. Um, oops, I don't know what's happening there. It's <laughs> keep going back a slide. Um, and then you'll see, uh, you know, there's, a, there's also an abstract. And this uh, last bullet point, the claims, now, the claims are actually, in some sense, the most important part of the application. And you can see there it says, the claims define the legal boundaries of the invention, similar to a deed to a property. Um, so the other information that will be in the application will be sort of a background um, in the beginning of maybe the field of art. And then there'll be usually a pretty detailed description of whatever figures are included, um, and then, at least in the US, we put the claims at the end. At the end of that um, patent or patent application, then you'll find the claims. And that's where there's some, you know, sort of legalese that's commonly used. Um, and that's where the, the process gets a little more complicated in exactly how to word those claims, what to include in them, um, and that sort of thing, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about. So here you can see this, uh, you know, this is a, not a real patent. It's not 2040, um, but this is a swivel chair. Um, and so a claim for a swivel chair might start out, now we call this first part the preamble, everything that comes before the colon, um, which is like an introductory phrase about that claim. So a chair comprising, and then the parts of that structure are listed and usually the relationship between them will also be described in the claims. Um, and so you can see there, you know, there's a base, support arms, a back support, um, and how they're attached to each other is, is described in the claim. So this is a very simple example. Um, claims are often a lot longer and include a lot more um, references to parts of the uh, structure, but you can see here these reference numerals that point to different parts of the structure. In the specification, that's the part that's described in great detail, um, and and that will sort of uh, provide a background for how we understand these terms in the claim. And so you, you know you can just see the highlights there, kind of highlighting the structures where they are in the claim and where they are in the drawing. Um, and that's very important because we wanna make sure there's no confusion in the claim as to what we're talking about when we look at the specification in the drawing. Okay, so who can be an inventor on a patent? Um, anyone who contributes to the conception of an invention. So conception is another one of those sort of legalese terms. 
And what we mean by that is more than just um, being given routine instructions. So for example, if you work at a company and um, there's you know, an invention that, that maybe someone else came up with how exactly to do everything, and they just give you some basic instructions about you know, how to build maybe just one small component. So in that case, you may not be considered an inventor because you're not really um, contributing to that conception, that creative sort of spark of genius, you know, that we think about um, when we think of innovation and like new inventions. You, you're more just um, sort of doing something routine that's, you know, um, not considered, you know, inventive. But um, it's kind of a, it can be a tough call sometimes to figure out, you know, did someone really contribute to this invention or, um, you know, what exactly is the case? So, you know, in the case of if you're working for a company, you know, hopefully that company has um, some someone that can counsel you on that. Um, obviously, if you're, you know, a solo inventor, uh, you know, there's just you. And so you alone would be listed on the patent, even if, you know, you sent uh, prototypes so that someone could create um, you know, some instructions for someone to create a prototype, that doesn't make them an inventor. You are still the sole inventor because you provided all that information that was necessary for them to create your prototype. And so this kind of lists out the, the patent application journey. First, you know, you have your idea and you have to consider, is your idea worth protecting? Um, another thing that you want to consider initially is um, how how easy it might be for that idea to be um, for for really once if you do get a patent, how easy is it to enforce that patent? Um, if you know, really there there might be situations where really you would want to keep that idea to yourself, and that's something that we call a trade secret, rather than having the information about how to. Um, and the example given a lot is like a recipe, right? So a recipe, I mean, you can't patent recipes, but for a recipe, um, if you give everyone the recipe, they can make that recipe. They can make it in their houses. You know, how are you going to stop someone from just making that recipe once it's out there? So a recipe you'd want to keep secret. Um, so there are some things, there may be some aspects if maybe it's very easy to reverse engineer or, um, the people who would be reproducing it would be very hard for you to enforce that. Um, those are things you'll want to think about initially when you're deciding whether to file for a patent. Because patents, uh, patent applications are published generally 18 months after they're filed. So all of that information, even before you receive a grant of a patent, um, that information may become public. Uh, and so this, again, is talking about, is your idea eligible for protection? So these are, are four categories, and you'll see down here in the corner, it says 35 USC 101. That's the name of the statute um, that we, that sort of lays out uh, some of this information. So the four categories are a process, which also sometimes is called a method, um, a machine, an article of manufacture, um, a lot of a good example of that would be like a, a CD or something, um, and then compositions of matter. And so that's where you would get into the chemical and pharmaceutical um, patents. So is your idea novel and non-obvious? So again, these are words that do have a very specific meaning in patent law, and you'll see in the corner there, there's 35 USC 102 and 103. So 102 um, deals with what we call anticipation. So that's where maybe, uh, you know, if we think about that claim that we saw for the chair, if there's a booklet out there and it has all of those structures shown for a chair, um, we might look at that and say, oh, well, there's not really anything novel here because we have something with a back support and a base and legs and armrests. So everything that you've uh, recited in your claim, we, we already found that in this in this one pamphlet. And we call that anticipation because it's just one reference. Um, and non-obvious, that's a different standard. So that's where maybe we can't find all of the parts in a single reference, but there may be a combination of references that when we look overall at what these references teach, 
it still amounts to the same things that were described in that claim. So, um, you know, maybe if they specified that the chair had five legs and most chairs, you know, only have four legs, but maybe we find some other type of structure that can be used for sitting on a, a bar stool or something that has five legs, then you might say, oh, okay, well, considering that, you know, there are chairs with four legs and bar stools with five legs, it would, it would be really, you know, just sort of a simple matter to add an extra leg to a chair for stability. Um, so then we would say, okay, well, that invention, that's obvious because this you know, group of prior art references includes all of those limitations. And, and it would be a really simple matter to just, you know, modify this uh, reference here based on the teaching of the other reference. So that's what we, we would call an obviousness analysis. And again, you know, these are words that we kind of use in, you know, colloquial language, but they do have a more specific legally based meaning when we're talking about them uh, in the context of patent law. So we talked a little bit about this prior art. Um, the most commonly used prior art uh, tends in, in most arts tends to be other patents and patent applications, but it can be any printed publications, um, any other disclosures that have been published before your effective filing date. And your effective filing date is um, the, the filing date of your earliest applications. And I'm not sure if this slideshow gets into it, but there, there are two types of utility applications. You can file something called a provisional, which in a way is, um, it's, it's a mostly complete patent application, but you don't have to have claims in that application. But that locks in your date. So the date that you file that um, will be recorded as your effective filing date. And then within a year, you have to file what we call a, a non-provisional application. And that is a completed application that will include the claims. So even though that application that is examined is filed a year after you filed the provisional, you still get the date of the provisional um, because the two applications are, are linked together as long as you file that non-provisional within a year. Um, and so anything that was published before that first, that effective filing date can be considered prior art. Um, and I even there was a, <laughs> there was one rejection that an examiner did that I was working with where it was actually an episode of Seinfeld. Um, and so they took some screenshots from the video of, you know, a portion of this episode on YouTube and use that in the in the rejection and it showed you know all of the structure um it was like a, a telescoping uh, sort of device to, uh, out of the top of a vehicle um and there was an episode where you know one of the characters created something like that to deal with the new york traffic and uh all those parts were there so in their rejection they were able to use that episode of uh of seinfeld by including the screenshots uh, and also, so just to also mention that would also include, you know, things on store shelves, you know, if someone happened to know this was for sale at Target um, on this date, maybe because they bought it or something like that, you know, even um, things that aren't necessarily publications can be used as prior art, but, but the majority of prior art tends to be publications. So presenting your idea. Um, the bullet point here is maintaining confidentiality. So that seems a little contradictory, right? Like how I how can I present it and still maintain confidentiality? Am I telling people or not? Um, and that that also can be a complicated decision. So um, presenting your idea, a lot of people will have to do this to gain funding, to um, drum up interest, to find customers. But we talked a little about the effective filing date. What you want to make sure is that you're not um, presenting sort of the, the really inventive parts of your idea before you lock in that filing date. And in fact, you know, if you were to start presenting two or three years before you file for a patent application and you included so much information in your presentations that it essentially covered everything you're gonna eventually file in your patent application, even your own disclosures can be used against you as prior art, right? So we wanna be fair to the public, right? If three years ago, 
this information was made public, then we don't want to then three years later say, oh, okay, wait a minute, now we're going to give a monopoly, right? So you have to be careful about how much information you're providing when you are trying to, you know, drum up interest or find um, investors and that kind of thing. So that's why it says here, you know, it's best to maintain confidentiality prior to filing your patent application. That doesn't mean you can't say anything, right? There's there's certainly some aspects and some, you know, general overview of your invention that it's it would be fine to to publicize that. But um, once you start getting into details that, especially details that may be included in your application or details that may be subject matter of your claims, you absolutely want to lock in that effective filing date as soon as possible. Um, because whoever filed for the um, applicant, whoever filed their application first in, you know, sort of a race to the patent office, they're going to win. They're going to win priority and they're going to be able to you know, get the granted patent on something and whoever filed second will not be able to have that um, patent granted. So, you know, again, we mentioned here, consult with counsel about safe ways to disclose your invention before filing an application, um, because you wanna make sure that A, you're not creating prior art yourself, you know, that can later be used against you. Um, but you also want to make sure you lock in your, your filing date before you sort of say too much uh, to the public. And so now we're, you know, ready to draft the application. So we're going to look at, at some aspects of that. So we've talked about this, you know, it's, a, it's an exchange. So you're providing um, this wonderful new technology to the public. Um, and you're given a monopoly where you can stop anyone else from making or using, importing, selling for, you know, a limited time period, which for utility patents, that's 20 years from the filing date. But the, um, the other side of that is you have to fully disclose your invention so that the public can benefit from it and, you know, expand on it and, um, you know, have the benefit of, of that technology. If it's not explained fully enough for people to actually use your patent application to, you know, either make that or or improve on, you know, another device, um, then it's not a fair trade, right? There, you can't sort of hide how you want, you know, how you really um, make that invention or how you really perform the method, and then still get that 20-year patent protection. Um, and so you can see down here in the corner, this statute, the 35 USC, and USC just stands for United States Code. Um, that's what we call that, uh, that particular sort of compendium of laws. Um, and so 112 is the part of that statute that has to do with ensuring that um, your application and your claims especially are clear and um, a person, the, the standard that we use is an imaginary person of ordinary skill in the art. Um, sometimes people will call that a posita, you know, just sort of shortening that. But what we want to make sure is that someone who is um, of ordinary skill in that art, not a super duper expert, but also maybe not just a novice, right? Just ordinary skill, your average uh, practitioner in that art, they would look at what you've written in your, in your application, they would understand that, and they would be able to reproduce um, you know, that structure or reproduce that method. So here's some more legalese. Um, the first bullet point demonstrating that the inventor was in possession of the claimed invention. So that comes again from that statute 112. And when we say possession, what we mean is you, you really had solved the problem and fully realized the solution at that point. So when you filed your, maybe you filed a provisional, right, which is, which is that initial type of application you can file, you really had the, the full understanding and solution of that invention. Um, and that's important because if people are allowed to sort of file piecemeal applications, you know, here's a little bit about it. And then a year later in my non-provisional, I've added you know, my real solution, then they really shouldn't be entitled to that earlier date, right? We want that filing date to be the, the date when you really understood the solution um, to the problem or, you know, the structure to that invention, you really had it all together. 
Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean like every single minutia, unimportant detail, but whatever is truly novel, what, what you are really contributing to the art in that novelty, you should have a, a complete grasp of that um, at the time the application is filed. And the second bullet point, you know, um, if someone would have to do an unreasonable amount of experimentation to get to the solution that you did, then there is not enough information in your patent application. And it, it would fail because of this uh, statute 112A that requires, you know, a clear and thorough explanation of your application, of your invention in your application. Um, and the last bullet point, uh, best mode, that's another legalese term, um, which just means the best way of, of doing, you know, the best example you can give of how to actually perform that method or how to actually structure that device or, you know, how to create that, um, that formula or that medication. And so a lot of times people will just include what they may call um, an embodiment or that's, the, that's synonymous with like an example. Um, and they'll include a detailed description of that in the application. And also it's very important that the, the claims are clear. Uh, the claims are really what defines your invention, the meets and bounds, we call it. Um, just like, you know, the fence around that property, right? In a deed or whatever, um, the, the lines that show where your property ends and where, you know, someone else's property begins. So um, 112B, it's uh, used to be called, we used to, um, refer to these laws by the paragraph. So uh, we used to talk about 112 second paragraph. Now it's called 112B um, because laws are updated uh, every so often. So uh, 112B is basically saying you have to be clear and concise in your language. You can't um, you know, use terms in your application in a way that's the opposite of how that person of ordinary skill in the art would understand the term. Uh, you can make up um, compound phrases, you know, that maybe aren't commonly used. Um, you can refer to things in a way that's not necessarily common, but it has to make sense. It has to be something where if you, you know, you're looking at the definition in a dictionary or um, some kind of technical reference, the way that you're using the terms is also the way other people in the art are using the terms. And the last step will be when you actually file your application. Um, and it notes here, you know, you have to file a, a sworn oath or declaration that you invented the invention described in the application. And that's very important. Um, there are some countries where I believe companies uh, or, you know, non-person entities are allowed to be de declared as inventors. I think there might be even uh, one country now where a computer, a AI, you know, is allowed to, be listed as the inventor, but here in the United States, it has to be an actual human being, not a company, not a, a fancy computer. Um, and it's important that whoever really did contribute to that invention is listed. So you can have, you know, one or more inventors. Um, there's no limit that I know of on how many inventors can be listed, but they do have to all be people that contributed to that solution. And that's something that can be edited as you go along. Um, if you realize, oh, okay, well, really this, you know, as you're writing up your application and you say, oh, this aspect of it, this other person really solved that point, then um, you, maybe you've already filed a provisional, but when you file your non-provisional, you can correct inventorship. So here's some ideas about the fees involved um, in filing for an application. We have a scale here where depending on um, how large the business is, uh, some, some of the factors are also how many previous applications have been granted. Um, you may be uh, able to file for a micro entity status. I believe that's no more than five previous patent applications for that inventor. Um, there's also small entity, which is, you know, kind of in the middle between uh, small and large, but there's there's more information about exactly what the qualifications are for those different categories on our webpage, uspto.gov. And I think there's some links later in the slides that also clarify that. 
Um, but you can see it's a significant savings for um, micro entities and, and, and even small entities from just sort of the basic costs for a larger company. So I mentioned before that with patent prosecution, um, which is what we call this application process, there's, there's a back and forth. And this um, is kind of trying to show that with these loops here in the road. So uh, the first thing that most applicants receive will be something called a non-final rejection. Um, and despite the language of rejection, it doesn't mean it's over. Um, that's just where the examiner looks and finds, you know, if there are any issues with clarity in the application, if there's prior art that the examiner found that seems like it covers all of the claim limitations, uh, the examiner will present all of that to you in their non-final rejection. And then you would have an opportunity to say, oh, I disagree. You know, I think that this other uh, prior art doesn't really work the way my application does. Or you may say, oh, well, there's some other aspects of my invention I haven't put in the claims yet. If I add this feature, that's different than what's in this art. And you can, what we call, amend uh, around the art. And so that makes your claim a little more narrow, but um, that avoids any problems as far as, you know, the other prior art. And then eventually that may be, you know, the claim that's granted. Um, so it goes back and forth a couple of times between the examiner and the applicant. And then there is there is a point where that process kind of ends. You get a non-final and then you get a final. Then there's still some um, opportunity to talk with the examiner after the final. Um, but you can make a decision at that point about maybe it's maybe it's not worth it. Maybe you realize, oh, there's so much art out there that's so similar to what I invented, maybe it's not worth continuing the process. So then you might abandon the application. Um, or you might think, well, uh, the examiner just has it wrong and I'd like another set of eyes to look at you know, this prosecution history and make a determination. So then you might appeal, which is that lower um, curve here at the bottom. But uh, most applications, I think at this point, uh, ultimately, are the rate of allowance is somewhere around 70%, maybe a little bit lower, but most applications eventually uh, result in an issued patent. And so this process, you actually can go through a couple of times. There's more fees involved, of course, um, but it's not even, you know, sort of once you get past the final rejection, it, it's not necessarily completely over. There are There are options. Um, for filing what we call a continuation or a request for continued examination, where you can kind of start the round over again, go back to the beginning of the road and, you know, try again. So the role of the examiner, uh, definitely to understand the application, to search for prior art, um, we, like we talked about, you know, evaluate if there's something that's unclear in the claims and then send out the, the office actions. And uh, this last bullet point is really important, hold what we call interviews. And so um, that's where, you know, the, the applicant gets an opportunity to, to interview uh, the examiner about their understanding of the invention. And so that normally is um, scheduled around, you know, a half an hour where you can talk to the examiner. Maybe, maybe there's something that's just really difficult to sort out by communicating back and forth in writing, you can talk to the examiner and say, hey, this is what this really means, or you know, um, let me show you. You can show prototypes. We, we do video interviews, so you can have a video conference where you can show um, you know, some device that you've created, or you can have a PowerPoint presentation, or whatever you think would be helpful um, to help you know, change the examiner's mind about whatever that that prior art that they found or the clarity in the invention. And the applicant, um, you know, filing a complete application is really important. It, it greatly slows down the process if there are parts that are missing. Um, there is a duty to disclose uh, relevant prior art, and there's a special form that we use to do that. Um, and it doesn't mean, you know, everything that has any little thing to do with your invention, but anything that seems relevant that, especially if there's something where you think, oh, an examiner could use this as prior art, you would definitely want to disclose that. And it's, again, it's not going to necessarily mean, oh, if I disclose that, I'll never get 
a patent, but it may mean, you know, you have to amend your claims in the process um, to narrow the scope a little more so that you can get that application allowed. Um, and then to respond to the office action. So there's a set amount of time, usually about three months, where you you can respond to the application. And after that point, you get another couple of months, but you have to pay additional fees um, for that extended time uh, to respond to the, the examiner's office actions. And then the making good faith changes. So that basically means the kind of thing like, you know, amending your claims to get around the art if you agree that, you know, this art that the examiner presented really does seem to have all of the um, features of, of my invention. So that's just a little uh, indication of what uh, the, the front page of office actions really look like. And uh, again, they'll include any, so objections are um, usually for formalities, like if there's something wrong with the drawing. Um, rejections are based on some of those statutes we saw, 112, 102, 103, obviousness, anticipation, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's also office actions for allowability. You'll get a notice of allowance once your application is allowed. So I talked a little about this, you know, rejection. Um, it's, it's just part of the process. Um, they, they can often be overcome. You shouldn't look at that as, oh, I had a rejection, so it's over. Now I have to give up. Um, and so here it shows, you know, in, tw in 2021, 89% received a first office action and 62% um, eventually were allowed. So, so a rejection is definitely not, not the end, end of the world for that application. Um, did I go backwards? I think this is the same, same slide we already saw. Um, and interviews, you know, we, we definitely recommend interviews. You can see there's a difference in that allowance rate with interviews. And that's because, you know, as, as good as we try, I mean, sometimes just writing things down is not clear enough for especially complex inventions or something that's very unusual. Um, and so we talked a little bit about this already, the request for continued examination. You go back to the beginning of the road for a fee and kind of go through that process again. Um, you can appeal to our uh, uh, patent trial judges to make a determination if you disagree with the examiner. Um, and then even after final, there's an opportunity for, for response, especially interviews. Um, Hi, Jared, real quick. Mm -hmm. After the timeline process, um, mm -hmm. maybe we can get um, Janelle in since we have okay. 15 minutes. Okay, sure. So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's just an indication of time. I'm just going to go um, just to our resources slides quickly. Um, or let's see. Well, Inventor Assistance Center, all of these links, they're pro bono. So this helps uh, people who um, are under uh, certain guidelines for income, um, our PTRCs, also, oh, law school clinics and our PTRCs. All of these links um, will show you uh, more about that information in our resources. And I think that's, uh, and, and, this, and you'll get a PDF, I believe, of these, yes. these slides. Yes, I'll be sending a PDF after the presentation. Okay, I think that's, that's the last one. Thank you, sorry about the time crunch there. So I will stop sharing um, and turn it over to Janelle. Thanks, Jira. And perfect. Thank you, Kaya. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Janelle Breedvel. Let me go ahead and just share my screen here one moment. And can I just get a quick verbal confirmation that you can see my first slide? Yes, we see the slide. Great, thank you so much, Kaya. Uh, so again, Janelle Breedveld, I am the uh, Patent and Trademark Resource Center representative. I'm also a librarian at the State of Arizona Research Library. And Jara, thank you so much for that super informative presentation. I always learn new things when I hear presentations from the USPTO. Um, and thank you for giving me a few minutes just to highlight uh, some of the resources that are available from the Patent and Trademark Resource Center that's here in Arizona. 
So just a quick overview, as Jara already mentioned, so PTRCs have been around for a really long time and they're located nationwide, as you can see on the map here. And the goal is that we can really be a local resource to help disseminate information about patents and trademarks and support intellectual property needs. So PTRC representatives like myself are trained on USPTO resources and search engines so that we can really turn around and help the general public uh, use these resources and provide you with additional training on what you need to know to navigate these systems. So specifically in Arizona, uh, our PTRC had our grand opening here on October 9th back in 2013. This was at the Capitol Building in downtown Phoenix. Now we're located along with the Arizona State Archives in the Polly Rosenbaum Building that's at 1901 West Madison in Phoenix. So that's just across the street from the Capitol. All right, so here's the most important stuff. How can the PTRC in Arizona help you? So first we can answer questions. So presentations like the one we just heard from Jara do a wonderful job of really explaining the patent process uh, to you, but our staff are also here as a local resource in Arizona to help if you need additional clarification. We can also demonstrate searches. So it's been really convenient for us to um, share our screens essentially via a Zoom call. And then I can show you how to search different databases from the USPTO, view results. Um, typically, we always try to use generic examples when we do this. And uh, that's because we know you have wonderful ideas, but we don't want you to disclose them to us with the details. So we do demonstrate uh, just with generic searches. Next, show me the patent. So that said, if you're doing historical research or if you're just curious and you're trying to find a specific patent, you can come to us with a patent number or the name of an inventor, and we can certainly pull that information and share it with you. Uh, if you're interested, we can also show you how to search for that information yourself in the future. Now, what do you think about question mark? So as I mentioned before, we're glad you have ideas, but we don't want to hear the specifics for your own protection. So I'm a librarian, I'm not a lawyer, and I can't advise you on what's patentable or if you're interested in trademarks, whether you're infringing on someone's trademark. So what I can do is I can connect you to pro bono services that are offered through the University of Arizona and through Arizona State University. I apologize, my dog is here right now and drinking some water if you can hear that. Um, so I can direct you to some pro bono services who may be able to take on your case. Uh, I can also provide you with directories for lawyers so you can look for specific options yourself. Now, finally, location, location, location. We at the PTRC are the right place for a lot of questions, but there are also some that are still outside our realm of expertise. For example, on the trademark side, if you were specifically interested in registering a trademark solely in Arizona, not at the national level, that's something that's handled uh, by business services at the Arizona Secretary of State's office. So if you came to us with that question, I would just direct you there. Now, finally, just to highlight a couple things that are new specifically this year. First of all, we created two specific research guides, one for patents and one for trademarks. Uh, these contain links, examples, and lots of other resources to help guide you through this process. So um, these links are included in a handout that you will receive from Kaya after this presentation. And you can also see the link there on the screen. Next, uh, earlier this year, USPTO launched a web-based patent search tool called Patent Public Search. If you haven't seen this already, it's really exciting because it means you can search for patents in the comfort of your own home. So the previous search tools, uh, PatFT and AppFT, those have been phased out. So we encourage you to look at this tool. You can see on the screenshot there, there are some wonderful training materials from the USPTO uh, to help you navigate this. But again, our staff at the PTRC are certainly available uh, to give you virtual consultations to show you how to use this tool. Now, finally, just to wrap us up here, uh, the best way to contact us at the PTRC is to uh, visit the link that's here on the screen. This will take you to a web form that looks like this screenshot where you can include uh, information, your name, your specific question, and then I will follow up with you. 
This link again is also included in that handout that you'll receive from Kaya. And um, you can also go to our website, State of Arizona Research Library, and you'll see a big green ask a question button. If you click that, that will also get you to the same web form. So lots of different ways to contact us. We are so happy to help you with anything that you might need. So overall, I think that's it as far as uh, just covering specifically PTRC information here in Arizona. I really appreciate your time and attention throughout this presentation. And again, Jara, thank you so much for that uh, detail. It was really, really beneficial. Uh, are there any questions in the chat? I believe we had a question from Lindsay Kane. Um, it was, uh, she was debating whether to patent her ideas. She found a lot of similar uh, prior art. If she publishes the idea without a patent, would it be harder for someone else to get a patent similar product as it is now public record? Uh, Julie did uh, drop some information in there as well, but if you guys would uh, like to tackle that question. Sure. And Lindsay, great question. Um, that's actually something that some companies do as a strategy uh, when they want something to remain in the public domain. So um, it definitely could make it more difficult for someone else to get a patent on a similar product. Because um, again, prior art is anything that was out there and was published before uh, the filing date of that patent application. So if you Put it out there in the public and and establish that it's in the public record um i mean there's still a chance that no one may find it if it's you know a, a phd dissertation or something we can use those as prior art but it's a little harder to find them but if it's out there where someone can find it then it could be used as prior art to prevent another application from allowing okay do we have any other questions uh Thank you, Janelle. Janelle just dropped some, some links in the chat below that are, would be really useful. Um, if we don't have any questions, um, I, I think we can go ahead and um, close out. Oh, Joanne has a question. Yes, hi. Um, thank you for the um, great presentation today. It's a lot of information to take in. But um, we, our program has been working with some Native American artisans. Do they have um, the same opportunity to patent like their signature style of art or um, certain on certain pieces? Would that be an option? So for art, yeah, a design patent for something like um, jewelry or decorative um, items, a design patent is, is one option for protecting those. Um, also trademarks, uh, if there is a, you know, a signature style or a signature way they package uh, things that maybe they're sending to customers, if they have a logo, things like that would be subject for trademark protection. Um, and then and then some things would be subject to copyright. So if it's a particular painting, then that's something they would protect with copyright. Um, so so yeah, there's there's several options for uh, different types of art. Great. Uh, also, thank you for sharing the information on the fees for the patent applications. Um, we you know I've always thought that it was very expensive to apply for a patent and <laughs> just not you know like this micro small businesses couldn't do that but I think it's very reasonable um, for the micro um, applications so that's good to know. Thank Enjoy you so. Sorry to interrupt. I was going to say that's too, again, where some of those different pro bono programs may come in mm -hmm. as far as applicants are still responsible for those USPTO fees that Jara shared. But as far as the actual legal fees, um, if a client was accepted into one of those programs, those legal fees would be covered. So that would at least reduce the cost in that way. Great. All right. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. If we have no more questions, then we can go ahead and close out. So uh, just before we do that, uh, just a couple of reminders. Uh, first of all, thank you to our speakers, Sarah and Janelle. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. 
a lot of information there. And thank you for sharing um, the documents that I will send out to everyone after this webinar with more information because it's definitely a lot of information to go around. And you can find more of our events here. We're doing our next one in September, not September, sorry, way off. Uh, December, December 6th, I believe. Is that right, Julie? Um, December 6th with... I, I think it's the 7th, actually. December 7th. 7th. December 7th for trademarks. And so uh, we'll do another one-hour webinar session. Um, and for information on, on that, you can find it once um, it's live. And you can find it on our website at ncaied.org backslash events. Um, until then, it's really great to have you all here. Thank you. Thank you.